All right, so mental health is a popular phrase today. And mental health is usually a topic, um, it's usually a hot topic whenever someone commits a crime uh, that's uh, a particularly um, a gray, a particularly grave nature a crime. So, you know, when something really bad happens in our society, we ask, uh, what do we know about that person's mental health? And so um, mental health is usually the thing we blame or the thing we look to as the reason that people do uh, some of the bad things that people do. And, uh, but before we start, I want you to understand that when we talk about mental health, uh, there is no agreed upon defi universal definition on what mental health is. Uh, but in general, mental health refers to one's emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Okay? Mental health refers to one's emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Uh, and so if a person is emotionally, psychologically, and socially well, we say they have mental health. But if a person is emotionally, psychologically, or socially unwell, we say they are mentally unhealthy, or they have mental health issues, or we say they are mentally ill. Okay? And so in this lesson, I want to discuss uh, three things that I hope will bring clarity and hope to our understanding of mental health. Uh, three things. I want to talk about, number one, where we start in our understanding of mental health. Number two, what's the problem? And number three, what do we need? What do I need? Where we start, what's the problem, and what do I need? And so there are some things in life, I think you'd agree, for which where you start makes little to no difference. So for example, if you wish to thoroughly clean your car, it makes little to no difference if you start with the inside of the car and then uh, wash the outside of the car, or if you'd rather wash the outside of the car and then uh, clean the inside of the car. It makes no difference. Uh, in this, in a sim similar way, if you have a, if you have a to-do list at work on Monday morning that you know you need to get done on Monday, you may prioritize that list in terms of most important to least important, but uh, in general. As long as you get all the items on the list done on Monday, uh, then it doesn't necessarily matter where you start on your to-do list. So there are some things in life for which where you start makes no difference. But then there are other things in which where you start makes all the difference in the world. And so I remember a friend telling me uh, the story of the time they were traveling and they stopped at a small hotel to sleep for the night. Yeah, and this, this was before the days of cell phones where you could, you know, read reviews online before you chose a place. And so it was getting late. They were on the road and they got off an exit that had a sign for lodging. And the young couple with kids uh, went into the lobby and asked if they had any rooms available. And an Indian man enthusiastically said, yes, they did. But uh, because they had had some uh, previously uh, bad uh, you know, you know, motel experiences, the, the wife asked the, uh, the hotel manager if she could, uh, if they could see one of the rooms first. And so at that point, um, uh, the, the, the gentleman walked them down the hall and showed them a room and, uh, and, and, and let them look around. And they quickly noticed that the bathroom in this room was dirty. And so the wife said something to the effect of, no, I'm sorry, we can't stay here. This bathroom uh, hasn't been cleaned yet. And at that point, the Indian gentleman, and wanting to remedy the situation and persuade the young couple to stay, grabbed a white cloth and a bottle of cleaning spray, cleaned the toilet right in front of them, and then, with the same cloth in hand, began to clean the sink. Now, give this guy an A for effort, but the fact is, if you're going to clean a bathroom, it's okay to start with the sink and then use the same uh, cloth to clean the toilet, but not the other way around, okay? In a situation like that, it makes a big difference where you start, okay? Well, so when it comes to our understanding of mental health today, I believe that it makes all the difference in the world where we start, and I believe the mental health field today, by and large, uh, is, is starting in the wrong place. In fact, I think it's accurate to say the mental health field starts with the toilet first and then with the same cloth 
uh, cleans the sink, and anyone who's anyone knows that true health is not reachable that way. Okay, and so the evidence I think that we're that we are starting in the wrong place is in observing what happens when someone commits a very serious crime. So whenever there's a mass shooting of some sort, or whenever there is suicide. Uh, or whenever a, a, a drug addict continues to do drugs, even though it's, he's clearly destroying his life and the lives of those he loves, whenever these things happen, the place we start in an effort to make sense of the tragedy is looking for an untreated mental illness. And because we do this, it sheds light on, uh, um, on, on one thing modern people seem to believe regarding mental health. Okay? Modern people believe that the cause of bad behavior in people is physiological in nature. Modern people believe that if someone does something real tragic, the cause of their actions must be on their broken biology or their messed up physiology because why else would someone do something so wrong? They must be mentally ill, or they must be mentally handicapped. And the reason we start here, folks, is because, is because we no longer have a worldview that helps us make sense of tragedy any other way. The fact is, unless we can point to a person's broken biology as the reason for a person's bad behavior, we don't have any other way to understand their behavior. And because we start here, folks, true mental health is not reachable. Starting here is like cleaning the toilet first and then cleaning the sink with the same rag. Health is not reachable that way. And so here's how I want you to conceptualize it. Right? The mental health field today says your emotional and, physiolog and psychological health are a result of your biology. Your emotional and psychological health are a result of your biology. Another way to say that is the intangible elements of your humanity, your emotions and your thinking, right? You, those are intangible. You can't touch those things. The mental health field says the intangible uh, elements of your, your humanity uh, are the result of the tangible elements of your humanity or your body. And this is wrong, folks. This is the toilet, then the sink. The correct starting point which I will show you is also the biblical starting point, says that the tangible elements of your humanity are a result of the intangible elements of your humanity, not the other way around. Okay? Or say it another way, your biology is a result of your emotional and psychological health. Your psychological health is not a result of your biology. Or the way I have coined it that makes sense to me is this. It's not my sick body which depresses my spirit. It's most often my depressed spirit which sickens my body. And we'll talk in a little bit about that. Yes, they do work on each other, but where do we start? Where we start makes all the difference in the world, folks. And unless our starting point is, uh, in our understanding of mental health, yeah, is correct, then we can't reach mental health, right? Now, so to really understand this, I, I want us to back up a little bit and give you a little uh, a history lesson. I want us to go back to 1943 with Abraham Maslow because this is really where our current mental health understanding derives from. In 1943, Abraham Maslow published a theory of human motivation. And his theory included this pyramid picture. Do you remember this picture from school? Uh, basically what this pyramid illustrated was the theory that human beings will not reach or even consider the, the higher pyramid needs of life until their basic, more fundamental needs are met. And humanity's basic needs on this picture are illustrated by, at, by the very bottom of the pyramid, which is labeled our physiological or our physical needs, which include things like food, clothing, and shelter. So Maslow said that if our physiological needs are not met first, our other higher needs cannot follow up. And, and the very interesting thing about Maslow's 
hierarchy of needs is that it, it was not a theory about the way things had always been. It was a theory about the way things now are if there is no God. You see, Maslow was a humanistic psychologist, and humanistic psychologists do not recognize faith in God uh, as a navigation for human behavior. In fact, you will notice on this pyramid that there is no pyramid level for faith in God because it's deemed irrelevant or unnecessary uh, according to humanistic psychology. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs was not a theory about the way things have always been. It was a theory about the way things now are if there is no God. And if Maslow's pyramid of human motivation is correct, then we need to ask, where does mankind start in his quest for happiness or mental health? Well, he starts by placing his energies into working to secure for himself food, clothing, and shelter. And once he acquires those things, then he can move to the higher needs such as you know, social life and self-actualization. And so here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that this is no one's actual experience in life. Okay. Two examples. Are you ready? Number one, take a father. When a father starts uh, uh, with meeting his family's physiological, physical needs as his most important contribution, he may meet those needs for the family, but the family will eventually feel in the end as if he's done them an injustice. So many a child, folks, is... Uh, forever angry at their father because all their father ever cared about was meeting their physiological needs. I sent the child support. Wasn't that enough? Right? And what the child wants to say to his father is, Dad, I'm not an animal who simply needs hay and water dropped in front of me every morning. In fact, when you say to me, what's most important for you, son, is your food, clothing, and shelter, you treat me like an animal, and I don't quite appreciate that. Okay? Now, is it a father's responsibility to work so his family's physiological needs can be met? Of course. But if he thinks that his family's need that, that, that what his family needs first is their physical needs met, he will do them an injustice. You put Maslow's first tier in your life and you won't reach true mental health. Okay? And take another example, making money. If you put the making of money first in your life, survival. You cannot live justly at the same time. What do I mean? If money is your first order when you go to work every day, you will injure people along the way. You will not treat people as they ought to be treated. Rather, you will treat them as your means to make money, that, that, to make the money you're there to make. People will be secondary to you. Now, should you receive money from the work you do? Of course. But it better not be your first order. You might as well clean the toilet first. Okay, It's backwards. And folks, millennials today, if there's any millennials listening, millennials rightly get angry at an education system whose only purpose seems to be to prepare them to make money. Millennials today want the higher tiers of Maslow's pyramid first. That's where they want to start. They don't want to waste time providing for their physiological needs. Millennials are daring enough to believe that if they reach for the higher tiers of humanity's existence first, their physical needs will follow. I counseled once with a, a young a millennial who said that he would feel like a failure in life if he gave up all of his artistic talent just to work a job that paid the bills. Okay? And you know, you know what he was saying? He was saying, I'm not a failure if I don't get my physical needs met. I'm a failure if I have all my physical needs met and do not live with purpose. Okay? That's what millennials feel, and they're on to something. Okay? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, folks, is no one's actual experience in life. He started us all wrong. The correct starting place in our understanding of mental health is the starting place Jesus spoke of in our passage for today. In Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, 
nor about your body, what you will put on. In other words, don't worry about Maslow's first tier. He was an idiot. <laughs> okay? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Millennials know it is. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So let me paraphrase that. Jesus said your survival does not depend on you going after your first tier needs. Jesus says your father's got your first tier needs covered. And then here's the pivot point. Here's where Maslow's pyramid gets turned upside down and we see Jesus' pyramid. Uh, verse 33, Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Did you hear what Jesus said was, is, is humanity's first need, the one that you must start with if you are to reach mental health? Your most basic need is to run after God's kingdom and God's righteousness, which is another way of saying your most basic need is spiritual, not physical. And if you're a millennial today, you already knew this in your heart, even if you didn't have the words for it, okay? Folks, our current mental health starting place is derived from Maslow's backwards hierarchy of needs, and therefore it's broken. Our current mental health field says, your emotional and psychological health are a result of your physiology. But the Bible says, no, your physiology is a result of your psychological health, okay? And the vast majority of people today do not have mental health problems because their bodies have broken down. Instead, their bodies have broken down because they have mental health problems, folks. And counselors and therapists who treat their clients' depression, for example, as a problem with their biology, with their first-tier need, will be very little help to their clients. Why? Because they have started looking for answers in the wrong spot. Now, does this mean that our biology does not impact our thinking and our feeling? Of course it, and of course not. Our biology does impact our thinking and our feeling, but it does so secondarily, not primarily. Our biology, in a sense, at, reacts back on our mental health, but only after our mental health has acted on our biology. So this, folks, is where we start or where we must start in our understanding of mental health, or we'll never reach mental health. Okay? The second thing I want us to discuss is uh, what's the problem? What's the problem? Well, if we start from uh, the biblical starting point, we find that the problem of mental health is something very different than if we started with Maslow's starting point, okay? If we start with Maslow, then we look for the problem in a chemical imbalance of some sort. And if the problem is a chemical imbalance, then the obvious solution is medicinal, okay? Uh, and again, we may find some chemical imbalances along the way, but this discovery shall not get us any nearer a solution until we are willing to admit that the imbalance is a secondary effect of the problem and not the problem itself. But when we start with the biblical starting point, we find that the problem is, th is uh, three things. Number one, the problem is more relational than we know. The problem is more complex than we know. And the problem is more hopeful than we know. Okay, So let's talk about the re more relational than we know. Uh, one of the theories of counseling that has a lot of validity today and that I uh, have gained a lot from is what's called family systems therapy. And family systems therapy basically says that we are all a part of a family system and in a family system, what one person does or does not do affects everyone else in that system positively or negatively. Therefore, if you want to understand why a person does what he does or thinks what he thinks, you must seek to understand the family system that he came out of. And that's, you know, that's rather obvious to us. Okay? We all sort of know that 
uh, family systems greatly impact our emotional and psychological um, well-being. Uh, but the, the biblical worldview says that we're actually more relational than we even know. The Bible says relationships are core to who we are. The Bible says relationships are not the frosting on the cake of your existence. The Bible says relationships are more like the cake itself. And this is another reason why Maslow was wrong. Maslow said that what's core for humanity is our needs for survival and relationships come later. But the Bible says, no, what's core is relationships and there is no survival without them. Okay? And so this is why, this is why solitary confinement is so punishing to a person and why only the worst of the worst criminal offenders spend life behind bars in solitary confinement. Okay? The Bible says, folks, that we are more relational than we even know. In fact, the Bible says we were made for relationships. What do I mean? Well, in Genesis chapter 1, God said, Let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. And the our image here refers to what the Bible describes as the triune God, right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You probably heard that phrase before. St. Patrick described it as uh, the three-leaf clover. It's one clover and three leaves. Okay? The Bible says that, um, that God is one, but he manifests himself in three persons, and those three persons are distinct from one another, but perfectly one with one another at the same time, and that's probably the greatest mystery of all the world, how that's possible. So, let me ask this. If God has always existed in perfect relationship with himself for all of eternity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, what does it mean when that same God creates us in his image? Well, first and foremost, it means he created us inherently relational to. He makes us like himself. God exists in perfect relationship. Therefore, because we are made in his image, we exist for relationship to. And this makes sense of why relationships mean so much to you. This makes sense of why death is so hard for you to deal with. You feel like relationships should continue on forever. Why? Because that's why you were made. You were made for relationship by a God who is himself relational. And so the fact that God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are inherently relational makes sense of the fact that you know you're wired that way too. Okay? But building on this, God does not just make us with a need for relationship. God makes us with a need for a particular kind of relationship. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have existed for all of eternity in a perfect love relationship with themselves. And that sounds weird, but hear me out. Okay? God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have existed for all of eternity in a perfect love relationship with themselves. Therefore, when this God makes us in his image, what sort of relationship do you imagine he created us to need and desire? Loving relationships. And so if we were created for loving relationships, then what do you imagine happens to us? when we either have no relationships, solitary confinement, or when we have relationships, but those relationships are so broken and so bruised that they can hardly be called loving relationships. What happens? Well, here's at least one thing that happens. Mental illness. If you were created with a need for relationship, particularly loving relationships, and you do not have them in your life, it will mess you up. Okay, And you know this. There's not a single person, folks, that I've worked with as a counselor whose mental health problems could not be traced back to a breakdown in relationship somewhere, either their relationships with other people or even their relationship with God. Folks, people are broken in relationships, and we know it. People are bruised in relationships. People hurt people hurt people. We know that. 
So the Bible says the problem with mental health is much more relational than we know, since we were created for loving relationships than when we are not loved in relationship, but rather abused, ridiculed, belittled, controlled, mental illness is likely to develop. People, people are more relational than we know. The second thing the Bible says is that the problem is more complex than we know. So since we are all inherently relational, this makes human interactions infinitely complex. So, you know, modern psychology kind of wants to put mankind in a be in, into a beaker. We want to put people inside a glass bowl. We want to diagnose them with 30 questions and then say, this is what you are. This is what you have. And folks, this, in my opinion, can be so belittling. People, folks, people cannot be studied like an ocean specimen, okay? People are people. They're made in God's image. They're infinitely discoverable. I, may, I personally make a mistake whenever I say, this client is exactly like this other client I know. No, people are complex. Their personalities are deep. Their ponderings are profound. Their loves and their hates and their fears and their joys all somehow image the God who created them. So folks, you're not an animal, okay? You're not of equal value as a chicken. You were made in God's image. And for this reason, a man and a woman, when they come together in marriage, can expect to discover each other more and more until the day they die. Why? Because God has made each of them infinitely complex and infinitely beautiful. Yes. The problem with mental health, folks, is, is, is uh, more complex than we know because we are relational beings. Okay? We're not just bodies with different chemical imbalances. We are persons with infinite worth and value because we were made by a, by a God who is, infinitely, who is infinite himself. So the problem uh, with mental health is more relational than we know. It's more complex than we know. But thirdly, it's, it's more hopeful than we know. Right? If your biology is a result of your psychology and not the other way around, then if your psychology changes, guess what? Your biology can change too. If you became mentally broken in relationships, it's perfectly logical to believe that you can become mentally whole through new healing relationships too. And I've seen it happen. This, Folks, this is more hopeful than you know. Because, because we're led to believe today that we're stuck with our mental illness. It's a life sentence. And, if we, and you know what? If we factor God out of the equation like Maslow did, okay, maybe it is. But if God is a part of their, the equation, folks... There is always hope. Now, perhaps God may never completely free you from your battle against major depressive disorder, but don't you dare rule it out. Folks, the biblical perspective is that we do not have to be slaves to our body. In fact, what we'll talk about next week on Easter is how that God broke through the slavery of our body and overcame it for us. If you're a Christian today, you can know that you will not always be confined to a broken body because Jesus Christ died to give you a resurrected body one day. There's always hope. So what's the problem with mental health? Well, it's more relational than you know. It's more complex than you know. And it's more hopeful than you know if we start with the starting point that Jesus Christ uh, preached. So there we are. Uh, uh, what's the problem? Uh, where we start? And then the third thing I want to talk about today is uh, what do I need? What do we need? And I'm gonna, I, I want to I talk about what do I need by giving, by leaving us with four practicals, um, which I believe every person needs uh, to, to become or to be mentally healthy. Now, there is no magic pill, of course, that magically you know, makes uh, a mentally unhealthy person suddenly healthy again. People are more complex than that. But I want to talk about four 
things that I believe every person needs in their lives if they are going to be mentally healthy. Uh, and the first one is uh, a release of bitterness towards self or others. A release of bitterness towards self or others. Some people, folks, you know, live with bitterness for themselves or others. Some people, like we said last week, cannot forgive themselves for the things they've done wrong. Uh, they hate themselves, and this causes many, many mental health problems today. Folks, God did not create you to live with that bitterness. And I really want to encourage you that if this is, uh, if this is you, I really want to encourage you to go back and listen to my message on depression last week. Okay? God did not create you to live with bitterness towards yourself. In fact, you cannot live that way and live a full life at the same time. Okay? You've you got to get rid of the bitterness towards yourself uh, if, if you're going to be mentally healthy. But now others of you uh, live with bitterness toward others. You're living with resentments, and that, and that too, God did not create you to live with. Both of these things, folks, bitterness toward self and bitterness toward others, leads to mental health problems, okay? You need to release that bitterness, and you probably need help doing so, or else you would have done it by now, okay? Uh, so that's the first thing. That all, we, we, need, we all need to release uh, the bitterness we have toward ourselves or toward The second thing is, and, and I talked about this a, a little bit in the past two lessons, we all need disciplines in our life to foster our relationship with God. We need daily disciplines, which if God made us for relationship, we need disciplines to help us foster that relationship. And, and so the top three uh, disciplines, I think, for every Christian are these. Number one, out loud prayer. I really want to emphasize out loud prayer. God made us to be communicative creatures. Therefore, even though God hears silent mental prayer, I believe it's much more beneficial for you to pray out loud. And uh, so we need some daily uh, structured habit and daily spontaneous habit of out loud prayer. And so that may be a, a, a morning devotional time where you're voicing to God all that you feel, but you're also praising Him, you're interceding for others, you're praying out loud. Others of you, if you're more of a night owl, maybe you do that at night, okay? Uh, structured times, but also spontaneous times where you pray throughout the day. God made us to be relational. Prayer is one way that we can be relational all the time. The second discipline I think is necessary for every Christian is daily Bible reading. Daily Bible reading. Now, you're not concerned about how much you read. You're concerned about getting the Word of God into your brain because, again, like we talked about last week, what you think about affects how you feel, which affects how you behave, and therefore it's very important that you think about the right things. Some daily habit of Scripture reading where you are imbibing God's Word and letting Him speak to you. Think of it this way. Prayer is where you talk to God the Bible reading is where God talks to you. You need both. Okay. And then the third thing, the third essential, I feel like, for every Christian, and there's more than these, but I'm just going to list three, uh, is, is Sabbath rest. Rest. If you are working seven days a week, you can't be mentally healthy. You will break down eventually. We all need a weekly habit of rest where we, where we shut down. Where we and and you know what uh, uh, we we need to do this because if we don't shut down we we uh, we're deceived into thinking that the world can't survive without us. You know, God, I can't stop working because everything will fall apart. And God says, Whoa, whoa, whoa! You don't hold the world together. I do. Take a break. We need a a weekly habit of rest in our lives, or we'll go insane. We need it. So disciplines, daily disciplines, to foster your own mental health. Out loud prayer, Bible reading, rest. Need those things. The third thing I want to leave us with is we need an eternal advantage point. An eternal vantage point. Okay? Some of you deal with chronic anxiety and depression. And so some if, if this is you, some days are victorious and other days or even other weeks are not victorious. 
But the truth is that life is difficult for all of us, even if you don't chronically struggle uh, with one of those two things. And so in order for the difficulty of life not to break us, we need to be building an eternal vantage point. We need to be viscerally aware of the fact that as a Christian, this world is not our home. This body is broken now, but one day it will not be. This body malfunctions now, but one day it won't be so. We need, uh, uh, an, eternal, we need an eternal vantage point uh, that allows us to take our present pain and not lose sight of the abundant life Jesus promised to deliver on. So often, folks, we are afraid of pain. Every, uh, every instance of pain, we instantly want to take it away. But it, we need to be developing an eternal vantage point where, where pain is expected. This life is just hard, and it's always going to be that way. But if we know that in the end this life is, is hard, but it's not forever, that, that God is leading us to a place where there will be pain no more, we can endure that pain without going mentally haywire, so to speak. So we need, number one, uh, to, to release the bitterness that we have either toward ourselves or if you're living with bitterness, folks, you cannot be mentally healthy. It will eat you up. Secondly, you need disciplines in your life to foster your own mental health. Thirdly, you need an eternal vantage point. You need to be brought regularly to the, the reminder of that all that we're experiencing right now is, is, is temporal and that it will not last forever. Okay? And then the last thing I want to leave us with is healing relationships. Since God has made you inherently relational, the primary way, I want you to hear this, the primary way God is going to heal you is not through miraculous intervention, although God, may, God does that at times, okay? God's primary way of healing you, I believe, is going to be through healing relationships. You're broken in relationships. God heals you primarily through new healing relationships. This is what counseling is. It's a healing relationship. This is what sponsors and accountability partners are. They are healing relationships. This is what an older brother or an older sister in Christ can be for you, a healing relationship. Folks, all of us are broken through relationships, and God's primary way of healing us is through new healing relationships, first with him and then with others. So let me ask you, do you have these healing relationships in your life? Who has God placed in your path to journey alongside you? You were not created to journey alone, and if no one is experiencing with you the pain of your life, and you are living against your created nature. You need others, and others need you, and especially during this time, folks, of social isolation, it is crucial that you are sharing with others how you are doing. Do you have someone to pray with regularly? Do you have someone to weep and rejoice with? Who is that someone or someones? Or who could that someone be for you? But most importantly, as we close, you need a healing relationship with Jesus Christ. You need a healing relationship with Jesus Christ. Folks, since God has always existed in a perfect love relationship with himself, then when he created you, he did not create you to finally have someone to love. Instead, God created you to, sh to share with you his love. God created you to give you the love he has always had with himself for all of eternity. In fact, the earth itself was God's way of saying, look how much I love you. Look what I've created for you. The beauty, the sense, uh, all of it was created to show God's love to us. Okay, Folks, you were made for an eternal love relationship with Jesus Christ. This is why death is so hard to grapple with for all of us. Why? Because we know that we were made for love without parting. We know in our hearts that we were made for eternal love, but only the Bible is going to tell you that. 
You were made for an eternal love relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and this is your greatest need. The reason you want love so bad in this life is because you were made for love. The reason you want connection so much is because you were made for connection. The reason you want a spouse and children and grandkids and family is because you were made for those things. But all of those things, folks, are provided to you by Jesus Christ. And so first and foremost, you need him. You were made for him. You were made because of him. You were made to worship him. You were not made to live without him. You were made to live in him. If you do not have him, folks, you do not have all you were created to live with. And so as we prepare to surround communion together, let me ask you, do you have Jesus Christ? Do you have Jesus Christ? Do you believe in him? Do you believe you were made for him? Have you confessed your need for him? Have you gotten on your knees and cried out to the God who made you for love? Who made you to receive his love and to live in him? Have you done that? Have you repented of turning to other things that are such a lesser expression of love than Jesus? Have you repented? Have you invited him to rule your life? And have you let go of the rule of your life? Have you been baptized? As we prepare to surround communion, do you have Jesus Christ? We're going to uh, take communion together uh, right now. I hope that you received the communication earlier in the week uh, that we would be doing this. Uh, you simply need uh, the uh, unleavened bread and some grape juice. And as we do every week, we're going to read our communion scripture together. Uh, and then you will hear the music play. And I invite you as a family to take the emblems, bread first, and then drink. And when the song uh, finishes, Carl and I will be back on stage. So if you would, please read this communion uh, scripture with me as it appears on your screen. Or, uh, apparently it's not on the screen. I'm going to read it for us. And then as the music plays, please take the emblems. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this. In remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's commune together. 